God, I give you what I can today. The scattered ashes that I hid away, I lay it down at your feet. From the corners of my deepest shame, the empty places where I've worn your name, show me the love I say I believe. Help me to lay this be where I die, my Lord with thee crucified, be lifted high, my kingdom fall, once and for There is victory in my Savior's loss, in the crimson flowing of the cross. Pour over me, pour over me. Oh, let this be where I die. My Lord with thee, our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 12. Axed, axed, I said axed, too many T's in that one. Acts chapter 12. Now we're going to do our best to have scriptures up on the screens, but feel free to keep your Bibles handy. We're going to look at a lot of passages today. Um, it's a cool story. Um, I'm, a, I'm a sci-fi Nut. I love sci-fi. I do. Uh, I would rather watch science fiction than reality or drama or even comedy. I w you mix sci-fi and comedy together, that's like a great movie right there, okay? I, I, can, I can deal with that, okay? Um, but uh, I like sci-fi. But the thing is, the Bible's not science fiction, amen? These supernatural stories that we see and that we read, they're real. God really did these things, and these are accounts of them. And we're going to look at a very cool account this morning. We are going through Acts. We've, we've gotten to this point. We've watched as God has grown the church, caused the church to go out through persecution, and now that the church is going out, it's spreading abroad. We looked last week, or a couple weeks ago at Antioch, when the word Christian was first used there at Antioch, because the people were daily giving themselves over to really just choosing Christ. And they were walking uh, uh, with, with the things they were being taught by the apostles and the disciples and the deacons that were there. And so we looked at all those things, and so now uh, we're going to look at, at, at a, a point in time in Peter's life here. So uh, follow along with me if you would, and we're going to read uh, the first 11 verses here. 
Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And this is one of the sons of thunder, okay? This is uh, the Zebedees. Uh, so James was killed by Herod. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. I mean, what an important prisoner. I mean, he's got, and I could be wrong, like 16 at least guards just guarding Peter, okay? And so Herod was really worried about Peter getting out. And so he put all these soldiers on him. Verse 5 says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now that's the key verse, not so much for today's, it is for today's, but this afternoon we're going to continue on in Acts and we're going to get into uh, uh, really what is the, the, the purpose of that and what the church was doing. So verse 6 says this, And when Herod would have brought him forth, that same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And then verse 11 is, a verse that we're going to look at really intently this morning. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. As we look at this time in Peter's life this morning, I believe God would have us to see just how he works. See, there's three areas of life that God works in the lives of his children. So it's through us, or through supplication, for us, I'm giving you all three points right off the bat, okay? For us, which is salvation, and in us, which is sanctification. And we would do well to understand which area we're actually in right now. Now, I know that I am smack dab in the middle of my own sanctification, but uh, uh, there's another area that I should be in as well. We're going to talk greatly about that this afternoon. I encourage you to be here today at 245 as we get into that. But let's just keep on this morning. We're going to look... We're going to look at what this sanctification is and how we see it in Peter. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you again for this day. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be in your house. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we have the promise of your imminent return. Lord, I thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for that old rugged cross, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord. And I pray, God, you would help each one of us, Lord, to just set aside whatever it is that might distract us, Lord. You know how easily I get distracted, God. And Lord, help us just to focus on you right now. Lord, you know each heart. You know what we're wrestling with. Lord, you know if there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray, God, you would speak to every heart right where they're at today. Lord, no matter what my topic might be, God, Lord, you know what they need. And so I ask you, Lord, to move supernaturally in this service right now, God. Lord, and I promise, God, I will give you the praise and the glory. For you are the only one that is worthy, God. I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I can't help but see a totally different Peter now than what, when we went through John, we saw a different Peter. I mean, Peter was brash, he was uh, uh, impatient, uh, he was loud, he was filled with dread of what might come. You see that all through the life of Peter, but here he is, he's getting arrested. Why was he getting arrested? Because Herod wanted to. Well, that's not a very good reason, is it? But Herod just wanted the right, why? Because he saw that it pleased the people that were uh, still observing the traditions of the Jews as they were uh, noticing the days of unleavened bread. And so he thought, well, I'll just, if they're happy with this, he was a politician. He says, I'm going to do more and, and please the people. So he gra gab grabbed Peter up and had him arrested. Peter didn't pull out a sword and try and chop off anyone's ear. All right, that's pretty huge. 
Peter, you don't see him whining, you don't see him crying, you don't see him getting upset. What do you see here? I see Peter taking a nap as he's chained to two soldiers while there's at least two soldiers at each of the two doors that he has to get through to get out, not to mention probably two more at the gate, the outer gate. And so here Peter is taking a nap. This is Peter. This is, this is Peter who was constantly filled with wonder about what God was doing, who was constantly, even though he would say the right things sometimes, he would never hardly do the right things. But since his conversion, and his conversion happened that day by the fire at the Sea of Galilee when Jesus asked him, do you love me more than these? And you, I hope you remember the story as we studied through that. And, and so now uh, I see a different Peter here. His issues before the day by the fire with Jesus had never, it was that he had never truly seen his brokenness. But it was by that fire. It was after his uh, 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 betrayal or his denial of who Christ was in the courtyard of Caiaphas that he started to realize just how broken that he was, how in great need he was of who Jesus was and started to truly understand like, that crucifixion, who Jesus was. So Peter has now been converted. Peter is no longer the same guy that we saw in, in, in the three years of Jesus' life. He has changed. And we see this by his testimony of just laying down and taking a nap. I'll be honest with you. I don't know that I would be laying down and taking a nap. I'd be wondering, God, what are you doing? God, you know I don't deserve to be here, Lord. You know I didn't do anything wrong, Lord. There's no reason. Herod's just being a dirty dog. Strike him down, Lord. I mean, I would, re I, I would not be in this condition to take a nap. And I'm good at sleeping. But he didn't have a recliner. Okay, you put me in a recliner, there's no doubt what's going to happen within five minutes, okay? But he's not in a recliner. He's chained. I imagine he's probably on a stone or dirt floor, and he's chained to these guards. And what an amazing thing. We see the church knowing that he was arrested. Word spread, I'm sure. And so the church, knowing he was arrested, prayed without ceasing for him. You know what that meant? There was a prayer vigil going continually. And we'll get more to that this afternoon. But they prayed for him, and they prayed for him. But that drastic change brought something into the life of Peter that, man, I really want to get a good hold of, and that's faith. See, faith gives us eyesight past our conditions. Peter was in a condition right now that I guarantee you none of us would desire to be in, nor would we relish in it while we were there. More than likely, we would not be taking a nap and in full rest. Peter was in full Hey, listen, Peter was on the boat the day the storm came. And they thought they were going to die. Peter had been out on the Sea of Galilee many times. He had been in many storms, but he was one of those that feared for his life that day when that storm came. And yet, what was Jesus doing? Jesus, through the storm, was sleeping. Peter learned some things. See, walking with Jesus will do that to you. It'll, 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 learn, it'll learn you some things. It'll teach you some things. I done went full redneck. It'll teach you some things. Just leave it off, Jim. It's fine. I don't want to look over here anyways. You know what else? I think Peter understood that Christ was working no matter the situation. I think he'd seen enough to understand that, that God was doing something. And I think also this, I think he'd been with his church family enough, he knew that what they were doing. Now, you know what Herod thought the church was going to do? Herod thought the church was going to come and try and seize Peter back and get him. That's why he had all those soldiers guarding him. Okay? That's why he had all those soldiers take him to the jail. And so he was worried about that. But Peter knew the church was doing what was much more powerful than what Herod thought they were going to do. The church was praying. They were calling on the only one that could do something. And then God did. What an amazing thing. Now, I just, I, 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 as I do, I kind of put myself, I try and put myself into the story. And I don't want to be one of the soldiers because they're not good, okay? I can't be God. But I can, I, I associate with Peter a lot. And so I could just, if I was to have that kind of faith where I'm laying there and I'm taking a nap and, 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 and all of a sudden, somebody hits me in the side. I wouldn't react like Peter would either. I mean, Peter's like, oh, you know, I, this is how I feel. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'd be like, who hit me, right? But Peter, whoa, whoa. And the angel says, put your shoes on. Put your coat on. Peter thought he was dreaming. They walked right past the guards. Now, I don't know, all the gates opened, all the doors opened. I don't know exactly what happened. We know that one gate just opened by something. Now, come on now. 
Y'all remember, how many of you used to watch Star Trek, some of you older folks, right? Just a few, what is wrong with you people? Do you not know what sci-fi is? Sci-fi is so cool. But when, Kirk, when Captain Kirk would walk up to a door, he didn't have to twist a knob. He didn't have to wave over something. The door would just open, right? Just open of its own accord, right? Just his mere presence, you know? That's cool. I mean, I know we have stores at the grocery, doors at the grocery store, all that stuff. I know we have all those now, but anyways, it's cool. They didn't have that kind of stuff back there, but the, the gate just opened. Peter, coming to himself, he gets out and he goes, wait a second, this isn't a dream. I, don't tell me you wouldn't geek out, right? You'd be like, what just happened? What just, I'm not dreaming. What just happened? And Peter was excited. And we'll get to more of what Peter's next steps were this afternoon. You know, for some reason, God uses frail, sinful folks to bring out his purpose, to do what only brings him honor and glory. And so I want to look in those three areas that God works in frail and broken people. One, he works through us. And we talked about that. Supplication. Acts chapter 12, verse 5, we saw this. But prayer was made without ceasing for the church unto God for him. For Peter. You know, I invited y'all to come back Wednesday night when we went through announcements. We pray on Wednesday nights. We started about, I would say about eight months ago to where Wednesday night is about prayer. If I don't teach Wednesday night, that's fine. We come to pray. We come to pray as a church. We're praying for young Mary Cooper and God is working. We've prayed for people to be saved and added to the church and God is working. We've prayed for God to do the things that only God can do and God has been doing them. I've been testifying of this to other preachers. Pastor Dusty Ray down in Murfreesboro, my great friend, he's implementing it in his church this year. He's excited to see what God is already doing through that and how God is moving in his people. Prayer works, and we ought to be a praying people. If you're a child of God, you have access by Jesus Christ into the throne room of God. It's, prayer moves the heart, or moves the hand, that moves the heart, that moves the world. I, I forgot the lyrics of the song there. Prayer moves God. Not, not, not what I want, not how I feel, but prayer. Prayer moves God. And so they pray for him. Now here's the thing. I want my prayers to be answered. You don't have to raise your hand, okay? Don't incriminate yourself. I want my prayers to be answered. Here's the problem. I still struggle with sin. I do. I do. Bitterness, anger. When people cut, some, you've told, I've told you, my road rage issues. God's helping, okay, it's getting better. But my road rage issues, I mean, don't cut me off. Don't you realize you are interrupting my life, okay? You are messing up my day, all right? And so I'm liable to, to say things that I shouldn't say and do things I shouldn't do. And you know what? People have rearview mirrors. I see people in a rearview mirror when I do something, right? I don't do those things, okay? I don't always do those things. You know? But... People see how you react. No, they may not understand I'm a Christian or a pastor. No, those things may not matter, but what if I, <laughs> how many of you have ever road raged on somebody and then pulled in the same parking lot? Yeah. Well, I can't go witness to them now, can I? We ought not have willful sin. Psalm chapter 68, verse 18 says this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Well, that's pretty plain and simple, isn't it? You know what it means to regard iniquity in your heart? That means that you have sin that you've unconfessed, and it's on purpose. That means that you're doing something you know displeases him. You're doing something you want to do that he doesn't want you to do, and you're not confessing it. You're holding on to that, that regarding it. You're regarding it more than you regard him. You're loving yourself more than you love him. And that choice has been made. I've chosen myself over Christ. And see, when I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's kind of a, it kind of messes up the prayer life, doesn't it? It kind of messes up uh, me getting through to what God wants to do. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us this in verse 26 and 27. <coughs> and this is right after, I if you watched the Devo that I sent out this morning, uh, let us... Uh, 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 that I'm supposed to provoke y'all into good works and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And it gets this, for if, it's just talking about 
this is talking about being faithful to the house of God, folks. This is talking about being, not, not to the house of God, to the body of Christ. Being, let's put, being faithful to the body of Christ. Being faithful to the church that God has put you in. Then if we willfully sin, if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Jesus isn't going to die on the cross again. Now, you're not going to lose your salvation. But listen, there is a certain and fearful looking for judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. God is going to judge sin. And when I do not confess sin, I force God, according to Corinthians, I force God to then judge me. And when God judges, he chastises those he loves. Now, God doesn't want to do that. God doesn't want to do that. God doesn't want to chastise me. God wants to commune with me. He wants to walk with me. He wants to talk with me. He wants our relationship to be close and intimate and personal. But I can have sin in my life that causes that to not be what is actual. There should be no willful sin. There can be no spite. There can be no spite. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 tells us this. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, and be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. I have to be right with you if I'm going to be right with him. That's rough. That's rough. Yeah, but you didn't hear what you didn't hear how they talked about me or how they talked to me or what they did. See, if I'm, if I'm at my altar, if I'm praying and God lays it on my heart, and let me tell you something, he does. There's been, if you've ever received a text from me about 6.30 in the morning, <laughs> God put you on my heart because I got to repent before I can continue to pray. There's a, few fo- there's a few folks, I think there might be a couple in here, okay? There's some definite some folks I've had to text because I've done something wrong. Why? God says, if you're, if you're going to pray to me, you can't have ought against your brother. You have to make that right. And I'm not talking about, well, they did me wrong. No, you can forgive that without, listen, if you have to tell somebody you forgave them, you didn't forgive them. Okay? This is a different passage. And so if I've done something and I've offended my brother and I've messed up, then I need to make that right before I can be right with him. There can be no sin, willful sin, there can be no spite, and there can be no self. James chapter 4 tells us this in verse 3. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. God wants me to pray, but God doesn't answer my prayers when my prayers are about me. Guess how often my prayers are about me? A lot. Listen, I just went through this whole ordeal with my truck. You know how many times I had to repent for being an impudent child of God? I mean, yeah, my truck blew its engine for no reason at all. And you might be like, well, you probably, no, it was no reason, okay? And so I went through this whole thing, and I'm like, really, this is a tribulation, right? I can be an impudent child, and I had to repent often. Why? Because my prayer was about myself. And so, man, we can't be about ourselves. The prayer has to be for him. It has to be for his honor, for his glory, for his will, his want, his way. So we ought to be a praying people, and then prayer should be perpetual. It should continue on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us this. It tells us to be thankful, but it also tells us to pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Continue to pray. 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 We have prayer every Wednesday night. Guess what? I praise God for this. Let me tell you something. If there's been a part of my Christian walk that has been absolutely, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for here, uh, malnourished, I'll just use malnourished, all right? It's been my prayer life. And God started convicting me of this a couple years ago. And so, you know what, I'd have a prayer list and I'd read over it and and do a a couple things. Look, I I have a prayer list now. I I have a prayer list for each day of the week. And you ever want to know what day I'll pray? I pray for you, you just come see me and I'll tell you what day I pray for you because I pray for you every week, at least one day a week unless God laid something else in my heart. And I pray for so many people. And each week, I, and, and God has helped my prayer life to be something because my prayer life is important. And you know, because I want my prayers to be answered, I want God to work. I want God to move in your lives. I want God to do something. And if I want him to do something, I have to quit doing what I want. Start being. There can be no willful sin. There can be no spite. And it has to be continual. It has to be continual. And it can't be about me. And I just praise God. And I, re- I read a book that just really, just really put some perspective on prayer. 
Not that, you know, somebody's going, well, yeah, it's the Bible, Larry. You're right, okay? The Bible should give me good perspective on prayer. But sometimes I need to hear how God is working in someone else's life. It's good to hear those things. It's good to understand those things. But God has helped me. And so man, even yesterday, as I got out my prayer list and I started to pray my Saturday prayer list, I started to go down and I said, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry. I was just reading the list again. And I wasn't really talking to you. Lord, forgive me. Because I want to talk with you. I want to be with you. I want, I want your presence. And man, I praise God because there's been things in my life that has just been crazy that he's starting to see through. And it's because of prayer. It's because of prayer. And so I'm going to hold on to those things. It should be perpetual. That's what God does through us. If you're a child of God, you should be a praying child of God. Another thing God does is for us. And that's salvation. Look at this in verse 7. The Bible says in Acts chapter 12, verse 7, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and, 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 a, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell from off his hands. Peter got saved. Now, Peter was already saved. But listen, I get myself into situations, or God puts me in situations, and I need his deliverance. I mean, yes, we need freed from sin's prison. And that's why some are in sin's prison. They need let out of sin's prison. They need someone to lead them out. And so God can send an angel. Maybe you might be that angel. That's why we need to be a supplicating child of God, someone who prays, God working through us. See, I find this, that when God works, when God puts something on my heart to pray for, it's not going to be long before I'm doing whatever it is I'm praying for in that situation. Those that I pray for to come to salvation, God will put me in a place to witness to them. Try it out. Try it out. Some need lead from sin's prison. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 says this, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? They need somebody. And listen, I'm a pastor, but if you're a child of God, we're all supposed to be preachers. We're all, we all can ex, ex, expel the gospel to shout out what Jesus has done. Someone needs lead. They need illuminated in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says this, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the mind of them which believe not, lest the light of the gracious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There are folks that just need a light shined on them. A light, and there's something about that light. And you know, when you're in darkness, it don't have to be a lot of light. How many of you have ever been in a cave, right? And they turn the lights off, and you can't even see your hand, right? I mean, it's, it's, you can't even see your hand. It's so dark. But then... The, the tour guide, when I was there, would just light a, a match or a, a lighter. I knew what it was called. I got it. Light that lighter. And the, the light would start to make the darkness go away. And just that little bit of light would cause, so we could actually see where we were going somewhat. I mean, it, it's amazing what a little bit of light to do. You don't have to be a great big light. You don't have to be a pastor of a church. You don't have to be something uh, 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 great in order to win someone to Christ. All you have to be is a child of God who loves God. That's it. Someone who's praying and someone who wants to be used as that light because there are those that need illuminated and there are those that need liberty. Peter was bound up. He was not free to do what he wanted. He needed liberty. John 8, 36 tells us this. If the, son of their, if, the, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I love this verse. God used this verse back in uh, 2006 to really make me start to understand what it meant to be free. You see, I am not free to be me. <laughs> no, no. That's stupid. Okay? I, I can do whatever I want because I'm saved. That's just dumb. Do we not get about the willful sin thing and, and, and the self and all that stuff, right? Remember all that? So it can't be that. No, I am free from being me. I am free because Jesus Christ is my righteousness. He is my holiness. He is everything that I am not and wants to live in me so I can be everything that I am not so that I might glorify him. I needed liberty. Someone who does not know Jesus Christ needs, they need to be led to Christ. They need to see that light and they need to be liberated from the bondage of sin. God works through us, God works for us, and God works in us, and this is sanctification. Go to Acts chapter 12, verse 8, Jim, if you would. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he hath said unto him, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. See, I don't know what it was about Peter. <laughs> Peter liked not having his clothes on. 
Y'all remember when he's out in the boat fishing after Jesus has been risen, right? And the Bible says before he jumped into the water, what did he have to do? He had to put his clothes on. He had to put his garment on. Why? Because he wasn't dressed. He, here he was. He's taking a nap without his clothes on. The angel said, you got to put your clothes on. He had to be robed. That's what sanctification is. Sanctification is us being robed. He says, get up or rise. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 says this, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. God has equipped me to walk with him. God has equipped you, if you're a child of God, to walk with him. That's what sanctification is. Sanctification is us trusting him to be everything that we are not and cannot be. He says, get up. Gird up. He says, gird thyself. Ephesians 6, 14 says this, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. That breastplate of righteousness, that, that covers the, the sinful heart that needs covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that when God, and I know I say this all the time, but repetition is a great teacher, and so you all just need to hear it again. God, when he looks at Larry Hoff, does not see Larry Hoff, he only sees Jesus Christ. That's all he sees. But what do you see? What does my wife see? What does my in-law see? What does my children, my grandchildren see? What does my church family see? What do my neighbors see? What do they see? Do they see Larry Hoff and his righteousness, which ain't so righteous? Or do they see Jesus Christ? And so God gives me that breastplate of righteousness so I might look more like him and a whole lot less like me. Ephesians 4.24 tells us this, and that you may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness that holiness that righteousness it's nothing that i can attain to listen i can go out and be as good as i can witness to everybody do good for everybody give everything i have i can do all that stuff and it doesn't matter that's me doing something but when god is doing it through me there is no end to the resources that he has there's no end to what i can do he is limitless and he makes a limited individual to be more like him and it's amazing what we can do. We can be weary and well-doing, but with the power of Jesus Christ, with the life of Christ living through me, there's so much more that we can do. So he says, get up, gird up, and go out. The angel told him to follow me. We are to walk after the Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now listen, we're not talking about salvation here, folks. We're talking about sanctification. We're talking about what do others see. And it ought to be the desire of our heart. Jesus, you are my all in all. Jesus, come. Lord, thank you for the blood. Lord, thank you for the cross. But Lord, help me to be like you and not like me. That's what sanctification is. It's giving over who we are to who he is. Why? Because he has completed the law. He has defeated sin and death and those things that are going to consume me. Even in our salvation Sin and death can consume us. You understand, I don't believe that a child of God who has, who has called on Jesus Christ, I don't believe we can lose our salvation. I don't. But I believe we can choose to not walk with him and darken everything that he has done. God may still see a sinless Jesus Christ, but all I'll ever see and all everyone else will ever see in a life lived to ourselves is ourselves. I love Galatians chapter 5. It breaks down what the flesh looks like and what the spirit looks like so we can better discern. That's what the Word of God does. It divides us under who I am and who He is and says, okay, Larry, make a choice. Choose God or choose yourself. It tells us this, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth after, against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. This is talking about that war that Paul talks about in Romans. That war that goes on inside of us. Each and every one of us that are a child of God, there's the desire to do what you want, and there's the desire to please God. But if you be led in the spirit, of the spirit, you are not under the law. 
Now the works of the flesh are manifest. That means the works of the flesh, this is them. This is, this is how they're, they're seen and how you know them. They're adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to understand something. If I am without Christ, I cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If I am in Christ, but I'm living in these things, in this flesh, there'll be no inheritance for me in heaven. I still get heaven, but there'll be no inheritance. I, I relinquish those things. But, but, I love that God put that in there, that contradiction. It says, this is the flesh, but here's, here's me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections of life. That means died to self. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. This isn't just something that happens on the inside. Well, pastor, I die to myself every day on the inside. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. The, people are still going to see you if you're not dying to yourself and your flesh and crucifying that flesh on the outside. We must be a disciple of Christ. That's what following me is. That's what following, not me, following Jesus. John chapter 15, verse 8 says this. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Now that fruit that that's talking about, what Jesus is talking about, he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. You understand that, right? Bearing that fruit. Letting others see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These things that only come from God. We're, we glorify him when those things are seen in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Peter, or, uh, Paul says this to the church of Corinth. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now listen, we are, all, we are all to follow Jesus. And we talked a couple weeks ago about Barnabas. Everybody needs a Barnabas. Everybody needs someone to help them follow Christ. I have people that help me follow Christ. People that I look to, people that I ask questions, people that speak into my life to help me to walk with Christ. Everybody needs that. We need to see faith in someone else's life so that I can have this, the, the faith that I need. I need to read the Word of God so I can have the faith. How did Peter lay down in that prison and take a nap? Why? He saw past his circumstances. He saw, I love this picture, if you look at that with me, you can see all those different lines going, listen, when you're going through the situation, you can't see everything that God is doing. You can't see how God's doing this, and God's doing this, and God's moving over here, and God's moving over here, and you can't see all that, but with faith, you trust that those things are going on, that God is working on your behalf, because Romans 8, 28 is still in the Word of God, and we know that all things work together for them that love God and are the called according to His purpose. These are the things that we look to when we don't have anything encouraging to look to. And so Peter, I don't think he was worried about being in jail. Maybe he was, maybe I'm reading this wrong, I don't know. I just don't know how you take a nap in this unless you can see what's not happening. Unless you can see what you know is happening with that faith. We're called to live by faith and not by sight. That faith only comes through God's works. It only comes through grace. It only comes through a yielding to Him. And then grace comes full circle. Those who have been saved and are being sanctified need to supplicate. It just goes in a circle. We pray for those to be saved. We witness to them. We help lead them to Christ. We, get, we see salvation. And then we get sanctified. And we start to pray. And then that person that gets saved starts to be sanctified and then they start to pray and then they lead someone and it's just to be perpetual now see if all we're focused on is our life if all we're focused on is ourselves if all we're focused on is is what's going on here and now we're not going to see what's coming listen heaven's coming we sang this morning even so come lord jesus even so come we know that heaven's coming if you're a child of god i hope you know that heaven is coming and heaven is coming guess what else is coming damnation is coming 
Those that depart from life without Jesus Christ are going to enter into a devil's hell for all of eternity. And we ought to know this with the fear and trembling, helping to pull them out if even they oppose themselves to try and help them. Listen, Peter was laying there in the jail. He had to be hit. He had to be got up. He had to be pulled out. Why? Because sometimes you don't even know the situation that you're in. And so you need somebody to help you. You need somebody to help you. God works through us through our prayers. God works for us as he delivers us and gives us liberty. And God works in us as he sanctifies us. But all of this is for his glory. It's all about him. It's all about him. So where are you in his works today? Where are you? I mean, I wish I could say that every situation I get into, man, I just, I look past it. I'm, there are times I'm not, there's no nap for Larry sometimes. Sometimes I'm just filled with that dread and, and wondering. And, and yeah, I've asked God, God, what are you doing? God, what are you doing? You know what that is? That's a lack of faith. And the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. I want to have that faith. I want to have that faith. Where does the faith come from? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's a great question. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want faith? The only thing that's going to give it to you is getting into this book. Walking with Jesus. You know how you get in the book? You say, you know what? I don't care that I would rather watch TV right now. I don't care that I would rather do whatever hobby it is that you have. I'm going to read my Bible for five minutes, for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to let God speak to me. We die to ourselves and we live under Christ. And that simple step, listen folks, that's the first step. That's the first step. That's as easy as I can make it to apply to our lives. So we do that. Well, then what he does, that reading of his word uh, through the spirit starts to give us a faith. You know what? If God can do that for Peter, God can do that for me. If God can deliver David here, and if God can deliver Joseph, and if God can do, and we start to read these things, and we start to see what God is doing, and God is saying, I am your God too, I am your Heavenly Father, and I want to work in your life. They're not special. Listen, none of these people in this Bible are special save Jesus Christ. And yet God, time and time and time again, works through them, works in them, works for them. Why? Man, the only thing the Bible says is because he loves us. That has to be good enough. And when we start to let the word of God get in there, and we start to choose to do things the way he says, and trust him, and start to believe in him, and start to follow him, well, an amazing thing happens. This, this joy starts to like permeate your life. And then this peace, where you could take a nap in the middle of a couple soldiers chained up, Okay, and this joy starts to come out of your life to where people start going, are they crazy? What's wrong with them? And then, and then God starts to use you to speak into their lives as you're gentle, even though they don't deserve, you're long-suffering with them. Listen, if there's anything that I've had to really, really, really let God help me with, it's called being patient with people. Okay, pastoring would be easy if it wasn't for people. But people, guess what? People are just as stubborn as I am. Every one of you, even though you say, well, I'm not a stubborn, Pastor. Now you're a liar. We're all stubborn. But God will give you a long suffering. And then a gentleness. When that person isn't being what you think they should be, God will give you a gentle way to react. And then goodness, you'll even be benevolent. You'll do for them when they don't really deserve it. And then people start to see that faith in your life, that, that walking with him. Instead of walking for yourself. And they're going to start to see that, that meekness. Listen. You're never going to show somebody Jesus if you're showing them how good you are. It's not going to happen. That's not meekness. <laughs> that's actually the opposite. That's, that's pride. But people need to see that we know that we're nothing special. I'm just a sinner. That's been saved by the glorious grace of Jesus Christ. And there but for the grace of God, I'd be right where you're at. People need to see that, that meekness. And they need to see temperance. They need to see that, listen, I don't just go do whatever I want. I don't. Why? Because there's a lot of things that Larry wants that's going to get Larry in trouble. It's going to hurt Larry. It's going to take Larry to an early death. And God, God wants to give me things that are, make my life better. 
What's that temperature? What did God pick those, those joys in life, those, those things that we do, those hobbies, those vocations, those things? Man, let God lead you. People need to see that. See, you can tell somebody all about Jesus all that you want, but if they're not going to see Jesus in your life, you're really going to have a hard time breaking through whatever it is they've got up. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, can I tell you today that he loves you more than you could possibly understand? I've been saved for over 24 years now, and I still don't understand why he loves a sinner like me. But I know that he does. And he wants you to know today that he loves you, that he died for your sins because you cannot. And child of God, who should you be praying for? Who should you be praying for? Who does God want you to be that angel that leads them out? Or are you Peter? And you just got to trust God. Where are you in that space where God is working in your life? Because every one of us are somewhere. We are there in need of salvation, in the middle of our sanctification, or ought to be supplicating, but maybe we're not. But we all should be somewhere. Let's all stand. If we're going to see the other side, if we're going to see past the situation, it's not going to happen because of who we are. It's not. It's only going to happen because of who he is. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes, if you would, please. I just want to ask you this. Listen, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, don't leave here today without him, okay? Please just come see me. I'm not going anywhere. I won't go anywhere until 4 o'clock today, okay? you got lots of time. But don't leave here today without Jesus. Let me show you from God's word how you can know the Jesus that I know. Child of God, maybe you just need to talk. Man, I'm a good listener. And I might be able to give you some light in a situation of darkness. I don't know. Maybe I've said some stuff that's wrong and you need to fix me. You come talking about that too. I'm okay with that. But don't leave here today without being somewhere where God is working in you, through you, or for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for how good you are, God. I thank you so much, Lord, that you desire, Lord, to show us this grace, Lord, show us this strength in due time, Lord. I pray, God, you'd help each and every individual here to understand exactly who you are as best they can where they're at in their life, Lord. Lord, and if, they're not, if there's someone here that does not know Jesus, Lord, I pray that today they would be saved. Lord, if there's someone here that Lord, they're, they're bound up and they don't even know why, Lord, just I pray, God, help them understand that you are the one that sets free. Lord, if we're a child of God that's trying to walk with you, God, help us to be one that prays. Help us to pray for the lost people in our lives, the, our neighbors, our colleagues. Lord, and then help us to be that messenger, that light, that one who liberates as we take them to Christ. Lord, Lord I ask all this and promise to give you the praise and the glory. Lord, I thank you so much for uh, these that are here. Lord, I pray, God, you richly bless them. I thank you for our visitors. Lord, I pray, God, you dismiss us in your love. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.